Well, I wrote a book on the 1927 uh, Mississippi River flood, which prior to Hurricane Katrina was the worst environmental disaster in American history. And uh, I came to this project by way of my upbringing, really. I was born and raised in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, which is the capital city of North Carolina. And um, I grew up in a neighborhood that was overwhelmingly black, uh, overwhelmingly Af African American. Um, I went to an all black uh, preschool, middle school, and high school. Um, there was one person, uh, one family actually, uh, that was non black, and that was a family by the name of Stubblefield, who lived across the street a uh, couple of houses down. And so one day when I was uh, around 10, 11, maybe 12 years of age, um, I, I asked my father, uh, you know, who this, who this guy was. Why was there one uh, white family in, in a neighborhood uh, that was uh, majority black? Um, and by majority black, I do not mean majority poor. It was a, a mixed income family in terms of middle class, lower class, etc. And so uh, my father proceeds to, to tell me that, well, you know, Stubblefield was, was actually here before we were. Um, as a matter of fact, this entire neighborhood was uh, all white when your mother and I moved into this neighborhood. Um, within a few years, the neighborhood was almost all black. Um, there was this white flight that occurred in, in, in many of these neighborhoods in North Carolina and across the country. So one of the things that I remember about my childhood is that we used to get these, these horrible ice storms. And these ice storms would uh, come through two or three times a, a year. Ice would accumulate on uh, the power lines, push power lines down, and take out electricity. Um, as kids, you know, we were um, you know, having fun during the daytime you know, make, making sleds and, sleds and et cetera, um, barreling down the streets. And it was all fun and games until the nighttime when it was time to go to sleep and, the, and there was no electricity. And anyone who's ever had to sleep in front of a fireplace knows that there's really only one person who's warm and that's the person sleeping directly in front of the fireplace. Everyone else is freezing to death. So, uh, what I also remember about that particular time period is, is how annoyed and how angered my parents were and the other adults in the neighborhood because CP&L seemed to have a policy of going to uh, the white neighborhoods first and slowly making their way over to the poorer communities and the minority communities. Um, and as it turned out, this was essentially a systematic practice that CP&L uh, would undergo in, during emergencies in the 1980s and 1990s. So as I grew up and you know, attended high school and into college and became interested in history, um, those memories stuck with me. And, and so I began to, to really think about uh, questions of environmentalism um, and, and what individuals deal with in the midst of environmental disasters. And in particular, how certain groups of people are uh, forced to deal not only with questions of nature, so-called nature, wind, rain, and water, but also social environments in terms of uh, sort of housing inequality, um, racism in terms of uh, jobs, um, transportation, not having access to transportation to, to be able to escape disasters. And so these issues became very important to me as I began to shape this history of the 1927 flood. And so part of what I argue uh, in this book is that African Americans uh, not only had to deal with the wrath of nature, but also had to deal with the wrath of being black um, in, in a segregated Jim Crow society of the Yazoo, Mississippi Delta. So in terms of framing this, I use uh, quite a bit of uh, imaginative literature as well as blues as a way of thinking about how African Americans understood their place within society in the midst of what was at the time the greatest environmental disaster in American history. Um, so, 
Why were disasters interesting to you as, as you began your career as a historian? Well, disasters are revealing moments of, of, of time, right? Disasters, epidemics, I'm also trained, I'm primarily trained, quite frankly, as a, as a historian of medicine. But disasters, epidemics are revealing moments, are revealing snapshots, right? So it's almost like taking a picture of a time. Period, right, so if you take a picture of Hurricane Katrina in 2005, you see a number of different variables. You see the the long history of vulnerability of certain populations. Um, you see sort of a, a long history of charity and discrimination within charity. Um, you see questions of access to automobiles. So a lot of what becomes difficult to see um, when there's not a disaster is reified when there is a disaster. One particular disaster that uh, really sort of framed how I think about history was the 1995 Chicago heat wave, and in particular, uh, a book uh, by a sociologist by the name of Eric Klinenberg. And in this particular book, he, he makes the case that uh, heat waves are somewhat sort of routine disasters, are so routine that it is difficult for us to, to really see what's going on in different places, right? So um, poor people in Chicago essentially had to make a decision um, whether to pay their rent or run their air conditioning at uh, excessive rates and risk high utility bills. Um, some chose not to run their air conditioning and paid the ultimate price, which was death, because they suffered from heat-related deaths. Um, but the question is not just a heat-related death, it's questions of sort of living in, in a high-rise apartment and not having uh, access to family and friends. It's living in an environment that's not protected by the police. It's uh, a neglected neighborhood uh, in terms of cracked sidewalks, poor lighting, etc. Right. So the heat wave is the, the image. Uh, the 1927 flood is the image. Hurricane Katrina is the image that allows us to see all of these vulnerabilities in different times and different places and among different groups of people. I was in uh, Manhattan during Hurricane Sandy, so I had a little bit of a, it was a very odd experience because I was there with a camera, I'm allegedly documenting things, but it just seemed impossible to go out and stick a camera in front of people's faces. When they were. I knew there were stories there, and important ones, but uh, I couldn't quite get the nerve to go and talk to people and, mm -hmm. you know, out on the streets. I probably missed the, the chance of a lifetime mm -hmm. to get those stories. But I kind of saw the confusion. Um, what kind of challenges does it present to you as an historian to document something as, you know, as, as kind of complex and confusing as a flood or a heat wave or a disaster of any sort where everything's happening at once? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the challenges uh, for me in terms of the project that I was trying to write and, and ultimately did write was that you know, African Americans didn't leave a lot of sources. Um, they were living in uh, you know, such a, a place of violence that it was sort of difficult for them to archive their sources um, or archive their voices, which is why the blues and imaginative literature is, is, is so important. Um, other challenges include uh, not knowing where to, to look for people, right, in, in terms of um, people who were a part of the 1927 flood or who experienced the 1927 flood, uh, who left as a result of the disaster. And part of my interest in this project to begin with was a migration narrative. Um, the reasons why people leave um, a particular place and go to another region is often the result of a natural disturbance. And that's a, a part of our historical past that we have not given enough credit to. So sort of thinking about how or why people leave a certain space and end up in California or, or migrate from uh, southwest Louisiana to Houston 
um, as occurred after uh, Hurricane Katrina. Um, those are important moments in which to, to think about uh, disaster victims. But you have to keep uh, an open mind. You have to sort of cast a wide net, so to speak, to be able to, to anticipate hearing voices in places that you might not think you're, you're going to hear them. Um, but also hearing voices in, in, in non-traditional archival sources, right? So in poems, in newspaper articles, uh, in music, all of these things sort of archive for us what people went through. Um, and, and also dealing with stress, right? So dealing with the stress of, of a disaster, dealing with displaced individuals. Um, it's a very trying time for, for people who suffer from a disaster, but many of them are willing and able to share their stories given the right circumstances. And the person who's sensitive to those experiences can really bring out a lot uh, in terms of uh, individuals who just recently suffered from an environmental disaster. Mm. How long did it take you to, to do that research? Well, this was my dissertation uh, at, at Rutgers University, uh, which I started in 2001, and I uh, probably went on my last archival trip for this project in 2012. So uh, between graduate school, being an assistant professor, somewhere around 10, yes. 11 years. Yes. <laughs> it's a long time yeah. to be with one project. And did the did this did the research fall into phases or stages or uh, it, some kind of pattern? It it really didn't, oddly enough. Um, you know, I had what I wanted to write, and, and as I said, it was difficult to find certain sources for certain parts. So um, I knew the blues were going to be an important part of that, and and the blues were were readily available for me. Um, but I also had to go where the sources led me, quite frankly. Um, I really, part of one chapter deals with the migration of self-described Creoles of color from southwest Louisiana to Houston, uh, uh, forming settlements known as Frenchtown in Beaumont, uh, in Houston, Port Arthur. Um, when I began the project, um, that wasn't on my radar. Um, I knew of this story a little bit, but it's not what I was focusing on. Um, but as I progressed over the years, um, I realized that that narrative was going to be a sizable part. So I had to readjust my, uh, my archival narrative and, and focus quite a bit more on, on that story. So you, you go into any project with ideas about what you want to say, where you're going to visit. Um, but essentially, the, the project will lead you to a, to a certain extent uh, and force you to to think about other issues and, and interact with sources that you may not have thought you would ever do. So it's a, it's a, it's an organic process, but but one that I enjoy. Um, now, the 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 surprising thing, what you've said so far, is is your interest in using music as as in the blues as a historical source. Um, First of all, how did you come to that idea? What what put you on to that as a as a promising way to to study this disaster? Well, actually, my father. Uh, when I told him that I was interested in this uh, disaster on the 1927 flood, he asked me if I had ever heard of this song called Tupelo, which uh, was recorded by John Lee Hooker. Um, which was on a, uh, a 1937 uh, tornado and flood in Tupelo, Mississippi. So it wasn't directly on the 1927 flood, but it was uh, also about a disaster in the, in the, in the Mississippi Delta area. Um, and so I, I listened to the song, and, and I was fascinated by it. Um, and this was before I actually entered uh, graduate school, but I was thinking about this project on the 1927 flood. And so blues, to me, would become a very important part of the project for a number of different ways. Uh, number one, because it sort of archives um, that which is unspeakable. And early blues emerged in the late 19th century, uh, early 20th century, and it was much more of a personal narrative. Right? Everyone could sing the blues. 
but there was no standardization of type. There was no standardization of routine or song. Um, everyone could sing different types of blues, and of course there was very little concept of copyright even going into the era of recorded blues. Interestingly enough, by the 1920s and 1930s, the blues moved into uh, another phase, which was the recording era. And there are, of course, uh, sort of many questions around this concept of, of race records. Uh, many uh, sort of blues musicians resisted this idea of, of race records. But what was interesting is that blues began to move into much more of a universal space at exactly the, the moment in which the 1927 flood occurs. So instead of talking about personal blues, which many people might be able to understand um, in terms of their own personal experiences, blues also began to talk more about group dynamics, uh, historical experiences, disasters, sharecropping, police brutality, uh, all of these things that African-Americans in different places could understand. So there was really a, a, a groundswell, so to speak, of blues musicians who began recording on the 1927 flood. And many of these songs were not recorded until the late 1920s or early 1930s. Um, but it shows the ways in which the 1927 flood was such a significant event um, that it, it it garnered the attention of such a wide array of intellectuals. Um, and so blues musicians fit into this particular space of, of describing the blues for posterity's sake and describing the 1927 flood for posterity's sake. And so these were musicians, but they were also entertainers, right? So Bessie Smith, I say all the time, Bessie Smith would not sing a word of backwater blues until she was paid. So it, it also shows the ways in which blues musicians are sort of moving in different spaces at the same time that they were uh, describing for the world uh, what black people were experiencing. So it's, uh, it's a very important medium, um, and it's one that, quite frankly, I could not have, have described the project or written the project in any other way uh, without the use of the blues. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm conscious of being being remiss to my to my audience here. I mean, we're talking about the 1927 flood as if it was common, but most of the people on this side of the of the of the television set obviously just have never heard of it, haven't thought about it, and so forth. Could you just for such people kind of recap what's what's important about this flood? Why why it's such a major event? Mm -hmm. Well. I always say that the 1927 flood was sort of the a result of, of a long-standing sort of environmental practice of, of building levees within the Yazoo Delta and building only levees. Um, so the practice that emerged really in the mid 19th and late 19th century of this, this levees only policy by the Army Corps of Engineers um, was really a drastic mistake in terms of uh, flood planning and, and disaster management. Um, so flooding was not unusual to those individuals living along the Mississippi River. Uh, flooding occurred seasonally. Um, but increasingly throughout the late 19th century and early 20th century, these floods were getting more severe. Um, part of it as a result of much more of the Mississippi Delta uh, or the Mississippi River and its tributaries and distributaries being confined within these walls or these levees. And so the 1927 flood was the result of an unusual amount of rainfall uh, within the Mississippi Valley. Uh, the Mississippi Valley is broken down into sort of the upper Mississippi Valley, which is where we are now in, in, in Minnesota, um, and the lower Mississippi Valley, uh, which is Louisiana and, and Mississippi. So excessive rainfall along the Mississippi River and its tributaries um, brought uh, a large amount of water into the valley. So snowfall in Montana, um, rain throughout Nebraska and, and Kansas, um, excessive rainfall in, in the fall of 1926 and the spring of 1927 um, in Louisiana and Mississippi. There were moments in which it rained almost every day for a month, um, six or seven inches. And so the ground was saturated um, and it put quite a bit of pressure on the levees up and down uh, the Mississippi Valley. And so the 1927 flood occurred from uh, Cairo, Cairo, Illinois, to the Gulf of Mexico 
um, in New Orleans. And so it occurred in, in seven states, uh, which included um, Missouri, Illinois, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana. Um, there were roughly uh, 200 uh, crevices uh, of levees throughout the Mississippi Valley and 42 uh, major crevices. Uh, major crevices meaning that uh, flood walls of water were released from levees uh, spreading out in, in some ways, in some instances, uh, 100 feet uh, from a particular uh, levee break. So, in particular, when the 1927 flood begins to threaten the cotton-producing areas of the Yazoo, Mississippi Delta, this is when the federal government begins to, to really take notice, right? Herbert Hoover was the Secretary of Commerce, Calvin Coolidge was the president. Um, most of what we sort of think about in terms of the 1927 flood is really Arkansas, uh, Louisiana, and Mississippi, uh, to the detriment really of, of a much more holistic understanding of the 1927 flood, my book included. Um, but it was when this, these cotton producing areas were threatened, this is when the federal government really began to, to mobilize. And not mobilize in the sense of, of, of disaster relief. You have to understand that disaster relief, in terms of how we think about it now, is really a post-World War II phenomenon. The federal government did not operate in terms of providing relief to ordinary citizens by the time of the 1927 flood. It was really the 1950s and the 1960s and beyond that the federal government mobilized to do those kinds of things. So Herbert Hoover, um, as Secretary of Commerce of the American Red Cross, would eventually sort of use the 1927 flood as a springboard to the presidency of 1928. Um, but, but part of how he understood and the federal government understood the 1927 flood was in terms of associational politics. In a sense, it was the responsibility of American citizens to help other American citizens through the Red Cross, right? So there was this broad solicitation campaign um, throughout the country. And in the post-World War I era, this was often framed as an obligation, a patriotic duty. So you see these appeals that it's your patriotic duty to give money to the American Red Cross to help your fellow citizens. And so what you see in that particular moment is this associational politics or new era politics um, that was sort of so well known in the 1920s. Um, but I also argue in my book that the 1927 flood in terms of pushing and certain organizations, certain groups pushing for the federal government to take much more of a stance for ordinary citizens really set the stage or laid more of a foundation for the New Deal politics or the New Deal era of the 1930s. So the 1927 flood was, was important for us sort of beginning to shift the ways in which the federal government uh, responded to ordinary citizens, um, but also uh, in terms of uh, thinking about a flawed uh, policy of, of management. And after the 1927 flood, uh, Congress passes the 1928 Flood Control Act which diversified the flood control measures throughout the Yazoo, Mississippi Delta, and also the Sacramento River in California. So it's, the 27 flood is, is really an important disaster for, for thinking about those two changes within American society. And what kind of loss of life and injury are we talking about in connection with the thing? Well, that's always been a contested concept. Uh, the American Red Cross in their official records records roughly 232 deaths. Um, every scholar who's ever written on the 1927 flood says that that's way too low, including myself. Uh, Pete Daniel, John Barry, um, myself, uh, Robin Spencer. Uh, we've all said that uh, that, uh, that number is way too low. Um, in that official number, uh, they are almost all white disaster victims, right? So there's no documentation of, uh, of African Americans who, who died and, and other individuals uh, because there were also sort of populations of Asians 
uh, Mexican descent uh, in, in the Yazoo, Mississippi Delta, who may have also suffered from, from the disaster as well. Um, but that number uh, is, does not sort of bear what uh, other sources sort of describe in terms of the loss of life, um, particularly for the Mound Bayou levee crevice in which you know, some reports say that in that particular break alone, uh, there were roughly five or 600 people uh, who died. Uh, so if I were to give it an estimate, I would say probably around 1,000 or, or 1,500 at a minimum, but, but possibly more. Now, from your early experience of the ice storms, you were kind of primed to expect that there would be different, there would be, you know, better services for white people than for uh, African Americans and mm -hmm. Mexicans, better disaster relief, better protection. Uh, is that what you found? In terms of the 1927 yeah, yeah, flood? Yeah. Yes, without question. Uh, in terms of the Red Cross relief camps, uh, uh, African Americans were, were forced into to labor, um, were, were ac actually forced into labor to, re to receive relief supplies um, that people were sending from around the country. Um, so uh, yes, there was Jim Crow law segregation did not go on hiatus during the 1927 flood. Um, there was still uh, inequality. Um, there were still ways in which um, sort of customs uh, of the time period were, up, were upheld even in the midst of that disaster. And did that did that work some you know did that did that work destructively then in terms of increasing loss of life, increasing suffering in, in important ways? Well, that it's hard to document in terms of loss of life uh, because it's hard to, to, to document loss of life in this disaster period. Um, but, it, but it does work destructively in terms of uh, mobility, right, which is sort of preventing different groups of people from, from, from mobilizing and moving to different places. Right? One of the things that Richard Wright, a uh, towering intellectual uh, figure who wrote two flood stories, uh, describes is that uh, sharecroppers in, in particular were, were really burdened with uh, not only sort of the loss of their own property but also uh, the loss of the property of, of the landowners during the 1927 flood um, which kept them sort of indebted to the landscape and kept them from moving to different parts of the Yazoo Delta, different parts of the south or even to Chicago or, or Detroit. Um, so what you see in different spaces, what you see from different sources, um, is that African Americans in particular um, sort of understood that uh, the federal government would not necessarily step in to protect them, right? So you have the American Red Cross, which is sort of a, a, a pseudo-governmental organization, right? It's connected to the federal government, but not really. Um, and so when these resources were being sent to the Red Cross, the Red Cross turns the money over to local planners. And the local planners then decide whether to give those charitable funds to uh, poor African Americans, middle class African Americans who are in need. And most of the time they decide not to. Um, and the federal government, uh, the Red Cross, uh, are, are decidedly agnostic when it comes to um, you know, sort of dealing with um, African Americans who are suffering and, and ensuring that those individuals who are in charge of the money apply that money equitable or, or in an equitable way. And so that's part of the experience that, that African Americans deal with in, in the Yazoo Delta. So is it fair to say that, that this this flood was was the last was this the last time that that disaster relief and this scale was sort of privatized in the United States. That is that it was that it was left to an organization like the Red Cross as opposed to taking over as federal disaster relief directly. Uh, no, it was not the last time. Um, but it, it, it was in the slow process. So the state was evolving, right? Just, just like the state was evolving 
in the lives of, uh, of ordinary citizens in the 1930s and the 1940s. It was also evolving uh, within the lives of those who were suffering from environmental disasters. Um, so some would argue, and I would agree, that uh, the state in that sense really did not emerge until after the Disaster Relief Act of 1969, right? So it, it, it takes a long and slow process, right? So, and when I say that the federal government did not open its doors, right, it does, but only in a certain way, right? So for most of the 20th century, the federal government reacted in terms of rebuilding bridges or roads, but not in the individual lives of those who are suffering. So SBA loans, uh, charity or small grants, all of those things only slowly emerged in the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, well, I guess, I mean, it's a natural question given that there have been horrific floods since 1927. Mm -hmm. um, you studied the, what went, you know, a bunch of what went wrong Mm -hmm. in disaster relief with that flood. Uh, have there been clear improvements in, in responses to floods mm -hmm. in this region? I think that there have been clear in, improvements in terms of uh, anticipating, knowing uh, what the dangers are in terms of building practices. The problem is that it is difficult to allocate money for something that may or may not happen, which is the problem of environmental disasters throughout history. Um, in some ways, uh, there is a, a capitalistic part of environmental disasters. In other words, um, for example, in the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, San Francisco had been, you know, city officials had been pushing for decades to uh, sort of enhance improvements or enhance you know different parts of the city. They could never find the money for that until the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, at which point you know you have to rebuild and so when you rebuild you sort of have better street lighting, you have sort of wider roads. You do some of the things that you've been trying to do for the past 10-20 years. So my point is that you know, unfortunately, we often operate in terms of a reactionary uh, sort of framework. Um, so we might know the dangers of, of flooding and how flooding might uh, occur or, or, or influence life here in, in Minnesota. Um, but we only respond to those things after the disaster has occurred, right? So there, there are many narratives that come out of Hurricane Katrina, one of which is that some people need help to evacuate after an environmental disaster. Um, if you ask people what the evacuation plan of New Orleans included in 2005, it was essentially get in your automobile and leave. Um, all of these years later, the evacuation plan for New Orleans is still essentially get in your car and leave, right? So there was a, a little bit of an upswell in terms of sort of thinking that, well, the people who are special needs populations, people who have asthma, people who have diabetes, uh, who are connected to, to various forms of medical technology might need help or assistance in evacuating Tulane Hospital or Charity Hospital. So these plans were in the process of making in terms of making sure that we have enough ambulances or there's sort of a connection between different hospitals and that the second hospital will have potable water to dialysize uh, or, or, or sort of provide dialysis for those individuals in need. Um, but we have poor institutional memory. So over time, as other things occur, uh, as there are other needs for uh, so the allocation of money, um, what we know to be true about disasters of the past becomes sort of suppressed in our imagination. And it, and it stays that way until another flood occurs or until another Katrina occurs. And, and that's the problem that uh, those of us who are interested in this sort of history have which is sort of increasing institutional memory, keeping institutional memory, but also uh, pushing governments, local, state, and, and federal, to, to really sort of allocate money before environmental disasters, or what we might call resilience, to build resilient communities that will have the tools available to, to deal with 
disasters before they come. Um, there might be people who would who would argue who would just say that what it comes down to in a lot of areas is that these just aren't places where houses and built and anything much except swamp really belong, <laughs> that uh, floods are inevitable, floods will get worse, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Mississippi is, is, is fickle and likely to jump its, tr jump its course. Uh, and, and so there are people who would, would want to say, well, what we, we, we got to prepare for disasters, but that can't be the whole story because, <laughs> to some extent, the whole area is is a huge disaster mm -hmm. waiting to happen. Do you do you think it, it, is, does your does your 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 work with the history here lead you to think about that also? Well, it it does, and. Uh... But but I also think that that some of that is is inevitable, um, right? If you if you live in California, um, you in certain parts of California, you know you're 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 also near fault lines, right? Um, so there there is, as one historian has, has put it, there is a price that we have to pay to to live in in certain spaces, right? And and disasters are are around us, right? If you live in uh, the Dust Bowl region, you could, you know, suffer from dust storms. If you live in North Carolina, it's hurricanes. If you live in California, it's earthquakes or being attacked by a grizzly bear or bees, right? So it's it's all of these things, right, that we have to, to, to deal with. And so, you know, my point would be that, yes, there there is a certain amount of danger that we all have to, to deal with. You know, even here in Minnesota, of course, dealing with excessive cold, right? That is an environmental disaster. Um, or in Texas, when you deal with excessive heat, that is an environmental disaster. It's not one that we think about, right? It doesn't produce those sort of images of uprooted trees and overturned cars that we normally associate with environmental disasters. But these are disasters, right? Um, I think the bigger issue is being able to um, plan for the disasters the best way that we can um, and and providing people with the tools and resources to be able to deal with those environmental disasters um, and you know that's that's sort of a, a network of uh, of options that is, is planned by government is planned by uh, different organizations so that it will give individuals a, an optimal chance of surviving in the event of a disaster so you spent a lot of years working on the on the book about the 1927 flood. Uh, are you going to stick with floods for your career or disasters or how do you how do you think about after that many years with one project how what how do you think about the next steps? Well, my second project is actually a a, a history of, of race and diabetes. Uh, in the midst of finishing my dissertation, Hurricane Katrina occurs uh, in 2005. And so I began thinking about uh, not only uh, sort of diabetics during Hurricane Katrina, um, but also sort of the long history of vulnerable, vulnerable diabetics in different spaces. And so one of the, the images that I uh, sort of would come across were these stories of diabetics being given uh, a, a fruit punch or other sort of fruit drinks to, to stave off diabetic shock um, in New Orleans uh, Convention Center or Louis Armstrong Airport. Um, and part of that was sort of to show how this breakdown of infrastructure uh, was rampant during Hurricane Katrina. Uh, to the point where those individuals who were diabetic could not access those things that would keep them uh, alive uh, or keep them in good health. Um, as I said earlier, that framework is, is a snapshot of Hurricane Katrina, but it's also a framework for the long 20th century. 
And so this project of, of diabetes, which uh, sort of is framed from the late 19th century through uh, World War I, World War II, the Civil Rights Movement, and finally back into Hurricane Katrina, really brings some of my research full circle because I'm still interested in disasters, just in a different context, right? Um, and Hurricane Katrina serves as the bookend to this project on diabetes. Um, diabetes is, is a complex disease that is, uh, to this day, caused by a still relatively unknown set of factors, including environmental um, lifestyle choices, diet choices, um, access to supermarkets, uh, access to, to different landscapes, uh, and also presumably physiological and, and genetic causes. Right, so it's a complex disease that cannot be pinned down uh, to, to one particular factor. And so in the context of Hurricane Katrina, uh, in the context of our late 20th and early 21st century society, I really think about these questions of access, uh, access to supermarkets, um, what some sociologists and public health scholars have described as food deserts, um, and the fact that some neighborhoods, some communities have really had to struggle uh, to have uh, not only certain restaurants, but also supermarkets and supermarkets that carry fresh foods to build and relocate into their communities. And in a place like Houston, um, Sunnyside community, for example, had to really fight for one of the local chains to come into their community. If a supermarket does not come into your community, you may be uh, you may have to take public transportation or, or travel great distances to, to be able to, to access those things. And all of those things are part of the environmental components of, of, of diabetes and of obesity. Uh, so that's sort of where I'm moving next, uh, moving much more into uh, the history of medicine side of uh, my training and my interests. Let's see. Um, well, that's an interesting combination history of medicine, history of disaster. Mm -hmm. um, just, just staying with the history of medicine matter for a second, uh, is, is medicine in some sense getting better at, at, at addressing catastrophes like floods and earthquakes and things like that? Is, is there progress in, in just in the technical end of this? I think there is. I, I think that uh, public health uh, scholars, advocates, and, uh, and those who work within the public health field uh, sort of understand how breakdowns in infrastructure can occur in, in the aftermath of a disaster, in the midst and the aftermath of a disaster. So you see uh, the mobilization of, of medicine, uh, of hospitals. Uh, around sort of patient populations who, who might struggle uh, from the loss of water, from the loss of electricity. Um, and you see these, you, you see this even within the media where uh, uh, sort of the local news stations might, you know, imagine a scenario where the excessive heat could cause problems for elderly patients. So even by saying, you know, check on your elderly neighbors or check on your elderly family members, a lot of those things are being pushed by the public health infrastructure, right? So in, in ways that are you know, sometimes subtle and in other ways that are not so subtle, uh, the public health is, is really sort of thinking about this subfield of disasters and, 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 how, it can, and how, how they can play a role in alleviating suffering. And disasters can be sort of widely considered, right? So it don't just, disasters do not just have to be from naturally occurring phenomena, so to speak, you know, wind, rain, water. Um, you know, disasters can be uh, an outbreak of, of a certain disease or illness, right? So there are different ways that we can think about disasters and the different ways that public health uh, officials respond to those disasters. I would think military technology would have some role there too, because that is, the military has learned how to move hospitals and medical supplies and come, you know, you know, learn how to make basic services portable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And actually, um, a chapter in my book on the 1927 flood deals quite a bit with the military. So the military mobilized around the 1927 flood to a, to a significant degree um, by bringing cots, by providing sort of tactical support. 
uh, by doing rescue missions, by sort of helping to immunize um, or provide uh, services, health services to those individuals who are suffering from the 1927 flood. So there is actually a long history of sort of military engagement um, with public health and, and disasters. Well, I um, look forward to your next book, and uh, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it.